Hello and welcome, friends. I hope everybody's having a great day so far. If you are new here, welcome. And if you're back, welcome back. I greatly appreciate all of the ongoing support. This is my channel, Dragon's Jewel Creative Gems, and I'm Tegan. And I'm just going to get all those wonderful YouTube stuff out of the way. If you haven't hit that subscribe button yet, please consider doing so. It's just down below. And if you like the content, please make sure you're hitting the like button on the videos. And of course, if you want to share some love down in the comments below, it's always greatly appreciated. And I absolutely love reading them. I do my best to make sure that I respond back and share some love in your direction as well, because naturally without you, this channel wouldn't exist. And I appreciate each and every one of you. And I thought I would bring some of those Halloween spooky vibes to the channel. Um, it, there are going to be in the Whip and Chat style format, but I'm going to read some ghost stories of Alberta, which is the province that I reside in. So I will have a spooky canvas that I'll be working on, and then I'm going to read a couple of ghost stories so that you can listen along while you diamond plate, paint, or work on another craft, or what you normally do during whip and chats kind of thing, and I keep you company with some spooky tales from my province. Um, so I figured that would be fun. So Someone's in the kitchen with Dinah. In the late 1970s, the Norwood area of Edmonton was a delightful residential community of older homes. The tree-lined streets provided a congenial alternative to the barren suburbs that had flourished as a result of the recent oil boom. Unfortunately, the years have not been kind to the area. Now it is run down and seedy, an area for those with ghosts of their own making haunting their very existence. It was not today's Norwood, though, that Dinah chose, and so when she brought the two bought the two-story house on a corner lot, she looked forward to calling the place home for years to come. This sort of stability of residence was especially important to the woman at that time because after working for a number of years as a horticulturist, Dinah be began making a career change. She was returning to the University of Alberta as a graduate student I'm very much looking forward to the positive effects those changes would have on her life. When I moved into the house, I was living with a man. The relationship was pretty well over by that time. It wasn't good at all anymore, Dinah explained. The short time the two lived together in the 1918 house was not a pleasant time for either of them. We would both wake up suddenly in the middle of the night and neither of us would know why. This went on for weeks and it became very draining, she said. Shortly after, the two parted company and Dinah continued to live in the house alone. There was definitely a presence in the house. The ghost or spirit or whatever it was restricted itself to the kitchen. It was a real nuisance though. Things would go missing from the kitchen and then turn up again a day or so later exactly where they should have been. One morning, I was getting ready to leave for a very important day at school. Some papers I needed were nowhere to be found. I spoke to the ghost. I told it I was getting thoroughly fed up with its tricks and that I needed the papers it had taken. Dinah advised the mysterious presence that she was going out for a short walk and then she would turn and when she returned she expected those papers would be put back where they had been. I did, it, I did as I'd said I would and sure enough when I came back the papers were on the counter where I'd left them the night before. Whoever was in the kitchen with Dinah must have been a free spirit. It didn't adapt well to living under the control of this vibrant and energetic woman's commands. Just a few weeks after the man she'd been living with left, so did the ghost. And Dinah was finally able to gain complete living alone status. Happily, neither the ghost nor the companion have ever re entered the Norwood home since. 
Ghostly Bookworm Edmonton is a city of shopping malls. It is home not only to the gigantic West Edmonton Mall, but also to dozens of cookie cutter same retail groupings. The shops along White Ave and Old Strathcona area are a pleasant diversion from this routine sameness. In 1986, a former school teacher added to the ambiance of the neighborhood and realized a lifelong dream at the same time. Donna Tremblay opened Griffon Books. The buildings along the popular strip are old by Edmonton standards. Some date back to the 1800s, many to the early 1900s. It was such a building that housed the newly opened bookstore. The owner was aware that the shop had, at various times, been a millinery store, a clothing store, and once even a shooting gallery. As the bookstore was the fruitation of many years of thought and planning, Donna expected few surprises. The first several months of operation were in fact completely uneventful at Griffin Books. Then just as the new endeavor began to feel comfortable, strange things began to happen. One morning, when she unlocked the store, Donna found books lying on the floor. There were books piled in stacks at very various places around the store, the proprietor explained. She was more than a little surprised, but because the show had to go on and the store had to open, Donna quickly filed the volumes back where they had been and opened the store for another day of business. That particular occurrence set a precedent for Griffin Books and over time a pattern developed. Every morning there were books out of place. Whoever or whatever was doing the rearranging clearly had certain places in the store that he or she preferred. Most often there were books stacked near the cash register or by the staircase leading to the basement. Donna explained and then added that she became used to these occurrences and merely scheduled sufficient time for tidying up before opening. The fact that an unseen, unfelt, and unheard present seemed to want to have a hand in running her business did not really bother the proprietor. The easygoing and confident lady merely accepted the inconvenience and worked around it. Several months later, concerned about both health and safety, the store owner hung no smoking signs around the store. The next morning, they were on the floor. Presuming they'd only fallen, Donna rehung them and opened the store for the day. All went well for two days. Then the signs were not found merely laying on the floor. One no smoking sign was found nearly 12 feet from its original place. Another was hidden behind some books on another shelf. And the third was found by the front door. The signs had clearly offended the ghost of Griffin Books. By trial and error, Donna found out that if she hung only one sign and only in a particular spot by the front of the store, it would remain in place. The unseen bookworm was not, however, as easily satisfied where the merchandise was concerned. During the entire time Donna Tremblay owned the store, books were sorted through and restacked each and every night. Every morning, the owner would reshelf the stacks and then open the store for business. There never seemed to be any melevance motivating the mischievous spirit, but he or she certainly was long-suffering. Like the shoemaker's elves, the spirit worked on, unseen every night, Donna Tremblay owned the business. The Wings Voices The staff of some of Alberta's haunted places take great pleasure in acknowledging that fact in their particular venues. They enjoy the status a resident ghost gives them, including a bit of extra public exposure, free advertising, and possibly additional customers. Other buildings are widely accepted as being haunted, but management's official stance is that this is not so. 
As is often the case, the denial seems to reflect their concern about their public image. The following tale about a well-known Edmonton landmark falls in the latter category. Once a public building, this particular haunted place was purchased several years ago by an adjacent business. Their official opinion is that they've never heard or seen anything unusual about the place and do not wish to discuss the issue further. The strange tales began to surface shortly after the building was bought by private industry. Its enormous shell of a building and its private function was to be very different from its public one. The purchase itself was a risky one because of the tremendous amount of money required to make the place over for its new purpose. Fortunately for this anthology, a personable young employee felt the building story was too good to be ignored. With the promise of anonymity for himself and non-identifying references to his employer, he spoke comfortably and at length. His suggestion of referring to the building by its standard nickname, The Wing, has been adhered to. As with many witnesses to strange occurrences, this young man, whom we call Ken, began his conversation by making excuses for ex his experiences. It's a big old barn of a building. That's probably part of what makes it so spooky. That and buying it was such a great financial risk for my employer. It was definitely a transition period for the company. Everything seemed to have a feeling of uncertainty during those first weeks. Ken's voice clearly reflect, reflected the discomfort he had felt at the time. Launching the necessary massive renovations did absolutely nothing to ease the discomfort everyone agreed they'd felt in the enormous and nearly empty building. Nearly is the pivotal word in the last sentence. Although there were a great number of objects left behind, one in particular was quite outstanding. A fighter plane. It was an actual fighter right there in the building. It had to be dismantled in order to be removed. The job took about two dozen people. Moving the plane out seemed to start a lot of bizarre tales from our staff. Lots of times they tell me that they could hear people talking when they were cleaning up after banquets. The voices were always off in the distance where none of our staff were. I never paid much attention to the stories. I'd never had the experience myself. I did know that I was never very happy about being in that building alone, but I could never put my finger on exactly why I felt that way. One night, this hardworking young man was given a very concrete reason. It was late and I was giving the place a last check before locking up for the night everyone else had left. As I entered the building, I heard a piano being played. The music was clear and beautiful. It was most definitely coming from inside the building. Despite the man's love of music, he turned and fled from the sounds. Stories continued to crop up now and again. The man listens with more interest now. It doesn't surprise me anymore when I hear reports of unexplainable experiences in or around the wing. Very recently, a dance group was using the place to rehearse. One of the young women approached Ken before she boarded the bus for their next destination. You know, the shaken dancer began, as I was leaving the building, the thought came to me that I'd forgotten something. Ken politely indicated that such an experience could happen to anyone, and he wondered what she could possibly have left behind that could have distressed her so much that her voice was shaking. But this wasn't like that, she protested. You see, it wasn't my thought. Cafe Painter Has Company Walter Embo introduced himself to me in a most unusual way. After listening to the radio station CKUA's interview about my search for local ghost stories, Walter mailed me a short note describing himself as Peter's neighbor. 
Indeed, the return address on the envelope was just around the corner from Edmonton Public Schools Museum and Archives. While listening to the broadcast, Walter realized he had some information that might be useful. I called him the same day I received his note and suggested we meet at Riglietto's, a downtown cafe. After brief pleasantries, Walter looked around the dimly lit cafe a bit uncomfortably. I wondered if I should have chosen a different spot. The man seemed distinctly ill at ease. This seemed such a contradiction to the witty note he had gone to the trouble of writing to me. I hoped that Walter had not changed his mind about telling me of his experience. Disappointingly, this had happened a couple of times in my hunt for stories. Thankfully, that was not the case this time. It was, however, discomfort I had detected. It's strange that you pick the spot, he said quietly. In 1985, this restaurant changed hands. The new owner was an acquaintance of mine, and I was looking for extra work, so I took, to took on the job of painting the restaurant for him. I'd forgotten until you mentioned Riglietto's as a meeting spot that I had an experience here that I'd never been able to explain. Walter worked at the painting contract alone in the evenings. Occasionally, to get the job finished on schedule, he was still there, brush in hand, well into the wee hours of the morning. Right from the first day, Walter felt a present in the restaurant with him. As painting walls and ceilings does not require very much intellectual power, he was free to concentrate on the strange feeling. The more Walter focused on it, the more convinced he'd become that he was not alone. I don't know what it was, but I know what was there. I suppose you could call it a ghost, but I don't really know what a ghost is, so I hesitate to call it anything. I do know for sure, though, that there was something there with me those evenings. It gave me a very positive feeling. I came to enjoy the company and even began to talk to whatever, whatever was out there. The spirit must have enjoyed either the recognition or Walter or both because it began to manifest itself physically. When he spoke to it, Walter would see little sparks of light darting from the room and feel gentle, gentle puffs of air gusting. Whatever it was never spoke back to me, yet I felt as though there had been dialogue. The energy was very childlike, not totally developed, and yet it felt very informed. Walter paused and then added, it's been years since I've thought of that experience, and if you hadn't suggested Riglietto's as a meeting place, I probably never would have again. When I contacted you, it was to tell you a completely different experience I had while living in a house in downtown Edmonton. Uninvited Guests Appearing relieved to have the first story told and off his mind, Walter settled into his cafe and the tale he had originally intended to share with me. The Boyle Street area of Edmonton has been skid row for dozens of years. Few people deliberately choose to live there. Most live there as a consequence of choices they made years ago. In January 1982, there were at least four exceptions to that generality. Walter Embo was one of them. Boyle Street may be the worst of Edmonton's slums, but it is also undeniably convenient to downtown. A friend of Walter's had moved to the area just for that reason. When a neighboring house became vacant, he suggested Walter would also enjoy being within walking distance of the city core, and a deal was struck. The slums of any city are old and rickety. They reflect the human turmoil they've housed. Neatly tailored lots of fences and clean property lines found in affluent suburbs don't exist around the homes of Walter and his friends. There were four houses on two lots, two large ones facing onto the street, each with a smaller one in its backyard. It was, a, it was while living in one of the small ones that Walter had an unpleasant, unexplained, and unforgettable encounter. 
On January 2nd, 1982, I came home from work extremely tired. As soon as I went into the house, I felt someone was there. I heard noises upstairs, and so I went to check. There was nothing there. But as soon as I'd gotten upstairs, I'd heard the noises downstairs. Being tired and feeling grateful to at least be at home, Walter was only mildly upset by the unexplained noises. Empton's harsh, dreary winters are well documented, but most residents have devised favorite ways of coping. Many like to remind themselves that spring's warmth and beauty will eventually return. Walter's way of doing that was to force plant bulbs on his kitchen window. The protective cones over these bulbs were the only things he could see that had moved as a result of the noises he'd heard. Puzzled, the man stared at the pots on his windowsill. As he did, two of the paper cones lifted off the bulbs and came to rest on their sides a few inches away. With increasing concern, Walter placed the cones and went about trying to make himself as comfortable as he could be. I felt little movements everywhere and I was so cold. No matter what I did, I couldn't get the house to warm up. I even had the kitchen stove turned on, but still I couldn't get warm. Thinking his exhaustion, exhaustion was causing at least some of the trouble, Walter headed for bed. He felt extremely uncomfortable and couldn't sleep. Soon he got back up and wandered aimlessly through the house as Walter stood staring out the window of his back door. He was delighted to see his friend in the larger house on the same property doing the same thing. The man was in his pajamas. He had a house coat on, but it was not done up. As soon as I waved to him, he did up the belt and then waved back. I knew there was no way I was going to be able to sleep for a while, and as my friend was also awake, I decided to go and visit him. We chatted in his kitchen, and after a few minutes he asked me if I didn't, if I didn't have to be going. I thought this was a strange comment, and I asked why he thought I should leave. Why? Because you have guests, don't you? I saw someone standing behind you when you were at the door waving to me. I didn't have my glasses on, so I couldn't make out whether it was a man or a woman, but there was definitely someone there. That's why I did up my house coat. Walter was shaken by his friend's statement and attempted to explain what had just happened to him. He asked his neighbor to watch while he returned across the backyard to the little house that he used to enjoy calling home. As any good friend and neighbor would, this man agreed and he phoned Walter as soon as he saw him go through the door. For three days, Walter Embo went almost entirely without sleep. I worked late trying to get tired enough to sleep and also to, also to avoid coming home. The pain he experienced 10 years before was clearly visible on his face as he was relating his, this story. After about 10 days, the uncomfortable intensity began to lift. A few days it was gone entirely, he said. Shortly after that, one of the larger of the two houses at the front of the properties came vacant and Walter moved in, as a friend had done for him a few months before. Walter informed another friend that the little house was available. His friend lived there for over three years and if he ever had any strange experiences, he never told Walter. The Chinese Ghost of 115th Street Ask Madeline Smithers about the Chinese Ghost of 115th Street. Edmonton writer and historian Tony Cashman recommended. The lady was pleasant, but admitted, he's not really my ghost. He belongs to my neighbor. It's a wonderful story. I'll give you the man's name and phone number. After leaving several messages for the neighbor, that were not returned, it became obvious the man did not wish to discuss his occasional visitor. Fortunately, Madeline knew at least the framework of the story. The Oliver area of Edmonton was at one time home to some of the city's most affluent families. 
Many head servants and an especially loyal Chinese houseboy is still seen every now and again. Dressed in the traditional black silk pajamas, the long deceased immigrant continues to circulate among guests when the older families who remain in the area entertain in their gardens. The helpful spirit must have worked for a neighborhood family around the turn of the century. Since then, the area has changed dramatically. High-rise apartment buildings have, to a large degree, replaced the stately old homes. There is no way of telling whether the resident ghost was affiliated with during his lifetime still exists or not. It is obvious, though, that serving at garden parties was a major component of the man's duty roster. Owners of, owners of the few single-family homes that remained in the coveted location are not surprised when one of their guests comments on the unusual waiter. Did the host hire the man specifically for the occasion? Well, no, in fact, they did not. His turn-of-the-century employer may not even have been located in the Oliver area. The loyal servant spirit may have drifted from his own area when urban renewal ended the ambiance he loved. The 115th Street locale may well have attracted his soul because garden parties are still occasionally given there. What is known about the houseboy is that he only appears during outdoor galas. He mingles with the crowd, always seeming to be busy and never approaching any particular guest. His distinctive attire isn't the only way to recognize the deceased immigrant. He gives another equally unmistakable clue to his identity. The ghost of 115th Street is not quite solid. Most guests don't notice at first but the Chinese houseboy, dressed in traditional garb, is slightly see-through. As the garden parties in the Oliver area disappear, will the ghost servant vanish completely? Equally puzzling is the unwillingness of Madeline Smithers' neighbor to discuss the spirit. A present as widely accepted as this one would have been difficult for anyone to dismiss completely. Perhaps the man enjoys his association with the phantom and does not want to share him. The House on the Hill Madeline Smithers is one of those rare women whose useful beauty has not faded with the years. It has only mellowed and matured. Today, in her 70s, Madeline's still exquisite face radiates vibrance and enthusiasm. Life has not tarnished this lady in any way. When she was a child, Madeline's parents lived in Drumheller. Wanting a proper education for their daughter, they sent the child to a convent school in Red Deer. During these years, report cards on each student's progress went home by mail to the children's parents. The students were left blissfully unaware of their academic improvement or lack of it. Madeline's wor world was a happy one. If geographically limited, it consisted of school at the convent and vacation times at home in Alberta's Badlands. As many teenage girls do, the young woman began to experience reoccurring dreams. I would dream I was standing on a riverbank looking up at a white house on a hill she explained. In the early 1950s, when we moved here to Edmonton, I recognized it immediately. This was the home I dreamed of over and over again. When I first walked in, I felt the house welcomed me. It was amazing that her adolescent and subconscious mind had known that she'd lived in this house, especially as it was a very unusual one. Most Edmonton residents line the city streets or avenues. Madeline's home is perched on the riverbank, and the only road access to it is via a series of back alleys. Despite the house's unusual location and Madeline's youthful dreams, the question remains, why would this lively and down-to-earth lady think her home was haunted? 
because I've seen the ghost, came the straightforward reply. She's a beautiful young blonde woman. She played several tricks on me over the years. One night, as Madeline was going up to bed for the night, a paper on the stairs caught her eye. It was one of my report cards from the convent in Red Deer. How would it have gotten here? She asked rhetorically. I'd never seen it before in my life. That certainly didn't diminish Madeline's interest in it now. Even after all these years, the lady's inquisitive nature had to be satisfied. It was from the year that I was eight. All my marks were very good, except the C I got for silence. But to this day, I have no idea how that card came to be in this house. It just appeared. Madeline is an accomplished potter. During a time she was taking pottery classes, she came home with a sheaf of papers that had been handed out. The middle few pages were recipes for different days, for different clays and baking procedures. The next day, when a friend asked to check some information on one of those sheets, Madeline picked the stapled photocopies up from where she'd left them on the dining room table. She was amazed to discover several sheets missing from the stack, although the staple showed no signs of having been tampered with. Years went by before Madeline ever saw those sheets again. Do you know where they turned up? They were in the top middle drawer of the sideboard in the dining room. That's where I kept my table linens. I'd been in and out of that drawer several times a week, every week since the recipes went missing. They weren't hidden under anything either. They were laying one beside the other on top of what's stored in the drawer. I couldn't have missed them if I'd been there if they'd been there before. The fact that Madeline lives alone in her scrupulously well-kept home only added to the puzzle. She just likes to play games was the only explanation Madeline could off think to offer. The only other trick she's ever played on me was to take curtain rods that a friend and I had bought and spread them all across the floor. While she is playing these tricks, Miss Smither's ghost has only made herself visible on one occasion. I was alone in the house reading. I felt someone was there beside me. I looked up and straight into the eyes of a young woman. She didn't frighten me in the least. She was only curious. She was so beautiful. Her face was right next to mine and she was staring at me intently. Madeline is not the only one to have become aware of the ghostly presence in the house on the hill. A university student stayed there to look after the place while Madeline was away. She was awakened in the middle of the night by a presence in her bedroom. Although the startled girl could not see the apparition, she felt it touch her face. Understandably frightened, she cut short her house-sitting assignment reporting that whatever it was in that room had definitely not wanted her in the home. If a standard explanation for this ghost story is wanted, it might be that a former occupant so loved the house that she refused to leave it even in death. Unfortunately, Miss Smithers' story refuses to be so neatly pigeonholed. The people we bought this house from were the original owners a middle-aged man and his elderly mother. No young woman has ever lived here. Is it possible then that somehow the beautiful young aberration was Madeline Smithers herself? Perhaps her young spirit somehow arrested in time. A delightful peal of girlish laughter accompanied the reply. Oh no, not a chance. I was never that pretty. Dream House Turns to Nightmare Lana and Mike Rose were ecstatic when they found their dream home, complete with a white picket fence in the pleasant Westmount area of Edmonton. We were newly married and full of vim. The house was just what we were looking for. It was very old-fashioned and needed repairs, but that was a challenge we both looked forward to 
Some of the features that indicated the home's age were ones they would carefully maintain. Both Lana and Mike considered the hardwood floors and enormous bathtub on legs to be treasures. There were other features in the house, though, that Lana especially would much rather have done without. The basement stairs led off the kitchen. They were narrow and steep. There was no light switch to turn on before you went down. You had to go to the bottom of the stairs and then to the middle of the room before you could turn on a light in the basement. To make matters worse, the furnace was the old octopus style with pipes crisscrossing the basement. Their ringer washer would only fit in one corner and the furnace pipes blocked most of the light single bulb in the ceiling provided. It got so I'd only do washing during the day when there was a bit of sunshine coming through the basement window. Even with this precaution, Lana was not comfortable in the basement. Every time I was downstairs, I could hear someone walking upstairs. I would run up to see who was there, but no one ever was. They weren't heavy steps, but light and slow. I locked the back and front doors and told myself the noises were just in my imagination because I didn't like being down there. It was easy to sympathize with the young woman's dislike for the cellar area of the house, but compared to the second story, the basement was cozy. The stairway to the partial second story also led off the kitchen. Like the one to the basement, it was also narrow and steep. The bedroom at the top of the stairs was tiny, with only room for a single bed and a hutch. The bedroom had a board about three feet by three feet, with a frame around it. It was the entrance to the attic. We kept this closed with a hook, an eye on one side and hinges on the other. To be more accurate, they tried to keep it closed. The hook and eye never stayed closed, which was a puzzle to me. It was like someone kept opening it. Shortly after Lana and Mike moved into the house, they invited Lana's sister and baby son to stay with them. The arrangement only lasted a fortnight and left everyone's lives changed. My nephew was having his nap in the upstairs bedroom. Suddenly, he let out a horrible scream. My sister and I both ran up the stairs. The door to the attic was open wide. The terror the two young women had felt was evidence even after all these years. I phoned my father and he came right over. He searched and found nothing. So he closed the hook and eye again and also jammed a knife into the attic doorway. Thinking all would be well now with his daughters and grandson, the man left. But he'd only been gone a few minutes when noises could be heard coming from the empty room above. I thought I'd better check it out. I didn't want to go up there because I was so scared, but my dad had gone and I couldn't reach my husband. I went upstairs very cautiously. The knife had been taken out of the attic entranceway and was lying about three feet from where my father had jammed it in. The knife certainly had not just fallen out of the crack and rolled all that distance. Attempting to salvage what was left of the afternoon, Lana gave her young nephew his favorite toy, the stuffed monkey that he had taken to bed with him before all the commotion. He took one look at it and screamed. The child's concerned aunt said he never played with that monkey again, and any time we tried to take him up to the bedroom, he cried. Something had frightened him badly. Feeling their dream home had turned, in, turned to a nightmare, the newlyweds and their boarders moved out less than two weeks later. They felt the presence had made its wishes clear. The little family was not welcome in his home 